Okay, today's lecture is going to be given by my father. It's on one-way slabs. You are not responsible numerically for what you're going to see, but theoretically you are. And I want you to focus on what's the same in what you've been doing and in the project that you're doing right now and what's different between beam design and one-way slab design. In the concrete world, my father needs no introduction. Stop, stop. <laughs> Everybody knows who he is. He, he taught me everything I know. He Not taught true. this class Not for true. 16 years. And I made a mistake when I was talking about him early in the course. He threw a one-hitter against Stanford in the 60s. It, it was a one-hit shutout against Stanford. I yeah. got yelled at when I got home and he looked at the video and I had said he two-hit. Just so just one <laughs> and, it, and it was there, too. It was at Stanford. <laughs> that may be on the exam. <laughs> one hit. Not, not anyway, uh, take it. Thanks, Dirk. Let's do a, we'll do a, a what I consider to be a very realistic uh, professional uh, design by hand of a reasonable uh, one-way slab, the type of, of slab that is very common in practice. A um, little background about one-way post-tension slabs uh, and about post-tensioning in general. Uh, the, the first post-tension buildings that were built in, the, in this country were built about 60 years ago in the, the middle 1950s. Uh, they were lift slab buildings. Uh, uh, you probably haven't encountered lift slab buildings uh, uh, because they've somewhat disappeared uh, through a series of, I think, bad business decisions and, and a couple of very nasty accidents. Uh, <coughs> Some of you have heard the name around campus of Ed Rice, Edward K. Rice. Um, Ed is a, has a lot of history with UCLA. He's a, a big donor to UCLA. He funds a professorship. There's the Rice Room on the, I believe it's the sixth floor of Belter. By the way, I can't say Bolter. I, um, it just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't come out right. Uh, he was the dean of the College of Engineering for the years that I went to school here, and he called himself Belter. So it's, for me, it's going to be Belter. I, I apologize. Um, uh, one, one of the things that you might not know about Ed Rice is that he was a, he's a real pioneer in post-tension concrete in this country, um, including the fact that Ed was a co-owner of one of the original lift slab companies uh, in, in the country, a, a company called Western Concrete Structures that was based here in California. So he, along with, with other executives of lift slab companies, went to Europe and actually brought the first post-tensioning system back to this country. So Ed goes back an awfully long way. A few years after he did that, Ed developed and patented the very first post-tensioned anchorage that was ever used in commercial buildings in this country. So very big name for all of us in the post-tensioning industry. He was also my first boss uh, when I went to work for T.Y. Lin and Associates in, in 1963. Um, throughout the history of post-tension concrete in building construction, building construction in this country, virtually all of the tendons, a huge percentage of the tendons have been unbonded rather than bonded. Um, virtually all, all of our U.S. test and performance experience is with unbonded tendons. So as a result of that, everything I'm going to say today, unless noted otherwise, and I don't think there's going to be any un unless noted otherwise, but everything I'm going to say today uh, as far as the tendons are, are concerned, will be based on unbonded tendons. <coughs> based on, on tonnage statistics that have been collected by the Post-Tensioning Institute uh, annually since 1972 and then estimated before 1972, going back to the lift slab days in the mid-50s, um, <coughs> I think we can reliably state that there are somewhat more than five billion square feet of elevated post-tension slab, slabs in service in the United States in buildings. That's five billion square feet um, in, in buildings in this country. Uh, so it's a big part of the construction industry uh, in the USA. 
the, the slabs are, are broadly categorized as either one-way slabs or two-way slabs, depending on whether they resist bending in just one direction only or whether they resist bending in two orthogonal directions. So um, basically all post-tension slabs can be categorized as either one-way or two-way. Um, I would estimate now uh, uh, one-way slabs represent perhaps 30 to 40 percent of the total market. It, it's reduced over the years. Two-way slabs are much more widely used now than one-way slabs. Um, one-way slabs, one-way post-tension slabs now are mostly used in clear span parking structures. Um, the slabs span between post-tension beams. Now that's a big market, you know, 30 to 40 percent of 5 billion square feet. Uh, so it, it, it's a big market, but it has gotten smaller over the years. When I, when I started, um, we would see an awful lot of one-way slabs in residential buildings, for example, in apartments, condominiums, and hotels. But that's fallen out of favor. Now, perhaps because of remodeling, you know, these were bearing wall buildings, and, and if you have a, a, a concrete bearing wall every 27, 28 feet, um, remodeling becomes a, a bit of a problem. It's a lot easier to handle changes with columns. Therefore, you, we see for residential construction, uh, hotels, condominiums, apartment buildings, uh, that almost all of that, those now have gone to two-way post-tension slabs. <coughs> The, you're going to get a really nice lecture by Dirk's partner, Brian Allred, next week on two-way slabs. Um, and I, I, he does it better than I do, uh, but I'll, I'll just briefly talk about the characteristics of two-way slabs. Um, two-way slabs are generally supported on isolated column supports, and they have relatively square base sizes. In other words, the column spacing in each orthogonal direction is roughly the same. Uh, it doesn't vary by much more than about 20 percent. Um, oops. If we look down in plan on a bay of a typical two-way slab with the columns spaced roughly the same span in each direction, um, and we were to look at the and we were to look at the the moments for example in in the span if, if this was the span direction we might get a, at the column line we we might get a, a moment diagram that looked like this where the relative value here would be uh, minus 6 this might be minus 6, and this might be plus 3 here. But if we were to look at the moments that existed in this direction right at mid-bay, it would be drastically different. We would see something like this. We would see much smaller moments, minus 1, say, and plus 0.5. So that's the most significant characteristic of two-way slabs is that the the, the bending moments throughout the slab vary um, with every section that you cut. There, there's nothing that's, that's the same. There is a peaking of moments. The moments are very high over the column. They're very relatively low at mid-span. So that's the biggest characteristic of two-way slabs. Two-way slabs also are characterized by the fact that, that um, they are very, very sensitive in shear whereas one-way slabs are not. The punching shear problem in two-way slabs is very, very significant. Uh, punching shear failures have killed people um, in, in two-way slabs, so it's very significant. The shear stresses, as you can see, as you can imagine, the, a, a small critical section right around the column carries the entire shear for the entire bay. So that has to be looked at extremely closely, and that is one significant characteristic of two-way slabs. But we're going to talk about one-way slabs today. And again, Brian will give you a great dose of, of two-way slab design next week. <coughs> one
one way slabs, the, the basic definition of one way slabs is that they have continuous supports. Um, and the, the, the supports can be either a beam or a slab. Uh, excuse me, a beam or a wall. The wall, of course, is non-yielding. There's a little bit of deflection in the beams, but it's ignored. Uh, the assumption in one-way slabs that span between walls and, and beams is that the supports are not yielding. And if you were to look at a plan of, say, a one-way slab framing, you might see something like this, where this was maybe a long span beam in a parking structure. We have a one-way slab spanning between these two beams. If we were to look at the bending moment diagram uh, in the slab, we might see something like this. We might see then six and three and six. Uh, and if we looked at it down here, we would see exactly the same thing. The, all of the bending in this slab is resisted in one direction only. The bending moment diagram is exactly the same wherever we cut it in the direction of the span. There is no bending in this direction. If we cut a section in this direction, it would always be a straight line, the moment at zero. Uh, the primary reinforcement in a one-way slab runs, of course, uh, perpendicular to the beam. There is us there was always uh, some what's called shrinkage and temperature reinforcement supplied parallel to the beams to resist stresses from shrinkage and temperature. Sure. It's assumed to be zero. The question was, is there a moment in, in, in this direction? It, I would say if the, if the supports are bearing, concrete bearing walls, no. For all practical reason, but purposes, there is no bending moment parallel to the wall. Um, it, you could argue that there's a very slight deflection in the beams if the supports were beams and that might produce a very small amount of moment but it is ignored. The practical answer is no. There is no there is no bending in this direction. All of the bending is resisted in this direction perpendicular to the beams. One-way slabs in, in post-tension concrete are solid thickness. You, you, they're prismatic, you rarely see any non-prismatic one-way slabs. In other words, the slab thickness, if you cut a section in this direction, the slab thickness would be constant. There, there might be a beam here, a beam here, but the slab thickness is constant. You very rarely see any haunches or non-prismatic sections. Virtually all of the one-way slab construction, post-tension one-way slab construction in this country is with prismatic sections. Um, solid thickness slabs. <clears throat> the maximum span that you normally see with one-way slabs in, in post-tension concrete is about 30 feet. Um, post-tension slabs operate in a range of span to depth ratios, L over H, of about 48. And that means that for a um, for a 30-foot span, that would result in a, in a slab thickness of about 8 inches. And you normally don't see um, slab thicknesses greater than that or spans greater than that just because it's too much weight. Um, the, if, if, that, if that occurred, if this, if this dimension got to be, say, 35 feet, most engineers would put a girder here and put another beam an intermediate beam here spanning between girders and cut this back to a say a five inch slab instead of an eight inch slab spanning or a nine inch slab spanning 35 feet. Um, it's just a matter of concrete quantity and economics. Um, one way post tension slabs in, in, um, in parking structures where they're where most of their usage is found, operate with a compression level, F over A, in the range of 125 to 200 PSI. I would start being nervous if I got a design that was up at 200 PSI throughout. Um, the, the right range, I would say, is down around 125 and 150 PSI. 
Uh, slabs with that level of compression historically do not have unusual problems with restraint to shortening. Uh, <clears throat> the in one way slabs a, a good rule of, sl of 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 thumb is to balance about 60 to 75 percent of the concrete dead load. That's a good starting point. Most one way post tension slabs um, end up uh, with post tensioning forces and profiles that balance about roughly in the range of 60 to 75 percent of the concrete dead load. talk about the economics of one-way slabs, and this really applies uh, not just to one-way slabs, but to all types of post-tensioning. Um, the reason that post-tension slabs are so economical is the savings in concrete. Post-tension slabs, as I said, one-way post-tension slabs operate in a spanded depth ratio of L over 48. Um, Non-pre-stress slabs, rebar slabs, operate in spanded depth ratios down around 30 or 33. Uh, so like for a 20-foot span, that would be a 5-inch post-tension slab, but it would be a 7 or a 7.5-inch rebar slab. So there's a big reduction in concrete, and that's the primary economic advantage of post-tension slabs. Um, the reason that post-tension slabs can operate in such a high span to depth ratio, L over 48, where non-pre-stress slabs operate down around L over 30 or L over 33, is the fact that there's a big reduction in bending. If you're balancing 60% of the concrete dead load, there is no bending in that structure uh, for 60% of the dead load. You've reduced the bending um, caused by dead load, which is the predominant load, by 60%. And bending is the most inefficient way that has ever been devised to carry a, a load from one from one place to another. It's, an, it's necessary because we need planar structures, but bending is very inefficient and post-tension slabs reduce bending and that's the primary reason. They use more of the cross-section. Think about a, a reinforced concrete beam in, in strength. Most of, most of the beam is, most of the concrete in the beam, uh, either for stresses or strength, is, is just used to separate the tensile reinforcement from the compression reinforcement. Uh, uh, so that's the primary reason for, the, for why post-tension slabs are economical. Um, <coughs> the other comparisons between a rein, uh, reinforced concrete or a, a, a non-pre-stressed slab and a post-tension slab is, that, is in the reinforcing and the forming. Uh, and they're typically a wash. The, the reinforcing in a well-designed post-tension slab costs about the same as the reinforcing in a well-designed non-pre-stressed slab, and the forming, of course, is, is the same in both. So the net savings, the, the, the basic economics, is a 25 to 30% savings in concrete. And of course, that concrete savings reflects in additional savings in every vertical uh, load-carrying element, like columns, walls, foundations, and it's, it's a huge advantage here in California for seismic framing. S the cost of seismic framing in a concrete building is virtually directly related to the dead load of, of the building. And if you can reduce the dead load by 25 to 30 percent, that's a lot of dollars. And that's why post-tension uh, slabs in, in tall buildings have been so popular in recent, recent years. Um, design of one-way slabs. They One-way slabs are designed as a constant width beam. They're designed just like a beam with a constant width. And in this country, that width is usually 12 inches, one foot wide. Um, in countries that use a metric system, it's one meter wide. And again, there's bending in one direction only. So it's designed as a beam that is 12 inches wide. That's what we're going to do. Um, Shear stresses are very low because the, the supports are continuous. There's no peaking of moments in shears. All of the shear, the total shear is resisted by the total slab cross-section, unlike two-way slabs, as I pointed out, where the total shear is resisted by a very small portion of the concrete cross-section. Um, 
The ACI building code requires a minimum amount of bonded reinforcing steel at the top and the bottom for crack distribution and ductility. <coughs> it's the same criteria you've been working with, uh, the 0 .004 times A sub CT. Um, specific code requirements that we will address. Uh, One-way post tension slabs, as you know, must be checked at three different load levels. One is at transfer of pre-stress force, which virtually never controls and we will ignore. Uh, the second is under unfactored service loads. That one is important. Um, and the third is at nominal strength under factored loads. <coughs> at transfer and service loads, the code limits um, the flexural stresses to certain values for this class. Tension stresses will be limited to 7.5 times the square root of F prime C. Compression stresses will be limited to 0.6 times F prime C. Um, for strength design under factored loads, the inflexure, uh, the slab, uh, the capacity is of the slab is based upon a tension compression couple with all the materials working at their maximum permissible stresses, just like you've been doing in beams. Um, and again, in shear, shear is normally very low um, in one-way post-tension slabs, and, and typically, you know, all that stuff you're going through in, in shear now, you, you, you'll never have to do that in one-way slabs because virtually every one-way slab in existence satisfies the code as a, as a non pre stress slab with just two times the square root of F prime C, as you'll see. Um, Okay, let's do one. I might, I might point out something that, that has interested previous classes. Uh, there's one other type of slab, of post-tension slab, that we haven't really talked about in, in the class. <laughs> but ironically, it's the largest market for post-tension tendons in, in the country. It's residential slabs on ground on expansive soils. So for any of you who have an interest in geotechnical engineering, this is a hot topic. Uh, uh, the, the amount of tendons that are sold in, in residences, in residential construction, in concrete post-tension slabs built on expansive soils, is larger than the sum of buildings, bridges, tanks, and tiebacks combined. The biggest single market for post-tensioning tendons in the country. Um, there are historically about 200,000 to 250,000 homes a year. Uh, uh, built with post-tension slabs. Texas has the majority because they have the most, uh, most extensive expansive soils. California is next. Uh, it's a very big market here in California. Uh, Nevada, uh, Texas represents about half of the market for tendons in, in residential slabs. California about 25 percent. And then Nevada, Colorado, and Lu Louisiana make up roughly the, 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 rest, the, the last 25 percent. The Post-Tensioning Institute has developed uh, standards for the design of post-tension slabs on expansive soils that are, are recognized worldwide in their design. The PTI method has been incorporated into every model building code. And the, basically the design of the slab is based upon the soils at the edge of the slab either swelling or shrinking due to adding water due to rainfall or removing water due to ev evaporation and transpiration of plants from the edge of the foundation. So just a, a, a matter of interest that, uh, ironically, um, residential construction, residential wood frame construction rep represents the largest single market for post-tensioning tendons in the country, but it's very, very specialized. Okay, let's design a one-way post-tension slab. Let's do a, what I consider to be a, a realistic slab. We've got five spans. Each one of them is at 19 feet. In parking structures, typically the beam spacing, um, you'll see anywhere between 18 and about 21 feet. So um, a 19 foot span is very typical in post-tension parking structures. Uh, <coughs> Using our span to depth ratio of 48, you quickly see that a 19-foot span requires a 5-inch post-tension slab. 
and we'll base our design on a five inch slab. And again, we get that from a spanded, the, the typical spanded depth ratio of 48. I'll draw in a tendon profile here uh, in each span. The, the tendon centers of gravity are, are based upon fire cover. Uh, the slab in a parking structure has to act as a horizontal barrier to fire, and that's measured in terms of an hourly rating, uh, a one-hour slab, a two-hour slab, a three-hour slab, and that's based on, on testing that's been done at laboratories that, that, um, that establish the criteria that allows the slab to remain functional for a certain time period under a known fire. Um, for post-tension slabs in parking structures, it's typical to require a two-hour rating for the slab. Um, a two-hour rating requires a tendon cover in interior, in interior spans of actually three-quarters of an inch. That would satisfy as a two-hour slab. Most engineers don't like three-quarter inch cover. It's just too small. It's just too tight. Most engineers would, will go with an inch clear, and with a half-inch diameter tendon, that means that the CGS at every support point is an inch plus a quarter or an inch, inch and a quarter. That's the dimension from the surface of the slab to the center of gravity of the tendon. Uh, same thing applies at the bottom of the slab. An inch clear plus a quarter of an inch to the center of the tendon is an inch and a quarter CGS at the bottom. In end spans, the code requires a little more cover to satisfy a two-hour rating. It has to do with restraint conditions at the edge, but um, suffice it to say that the code requires an inch and a half clear in end spans. So it, you typically see a CGS dimension at the low point at the bottom of a, of a two-way slab in, uh, I mean a one-way slab in a, in a parking structure of an inch and a half plus a quarter or an inch and three quarter. Okay, that's our starting point. Uh, we've established a five-inch slab based on typical span to depth ratios. Uh, knowing the two-hour fire rating, we've established the profile that gives us the maximum sag in every span. And what is that sag? <coughs> well, in interior spans, it's um, 3.75, this dimension here is 3.75 minus one and a quarter or two and a half inches. In the end spans, it's um, 2.5 plus 3.75. This is 3.75 over two. That gets us to this point here, to the bottom, minus one and three quarters which is one and three-eighths, 1.375 inches. So those are our sags, our maximum sags. We've got an inch and three-eighths in the two end spans, <coughs> two and a half inches in the interior span. Let's look at our loads. Now this is a, again, the, the loads are based upon a one foot wide strip of slab. So our, the dead load, the slab, weighs 5 over 12 times 150, <coughs> or 62.5 pounds per square foot. And let's say we have an added dead load of 3 pounds per square foot. That would be sprinklers, lights, uh, plumbing. A uh, typical value that most engineers use for that added dead load is, is 3 pounds a square foot. For a total dead load of 65.5 pounds per square foot, and using a 1.2 load factor, that's a nominal load, an ultimate load of, of 78.6. So 1.2 times 65.5 is 78.6 pounds per square foot. Typical parking live load these days is 40 pounds a square foot. And using a load factor of 1.6 on 40, we get uh, 64 
pounds per square foot. So we have a total load, unfactored total load, of 105.5 and a factored load, ultimate load, of 142.6. First thing that we do when we're designing a post-tension slab by hand, like we're going to do today, at this stage we establish our first guess at the amount of pre-stress force in each span. And how do we get that? We get that with the rule of thumb that says that typical post-tension slabs uh, have balance loads of between 60 and 75 percent of the concrete dead load. So let's start off on the low side and say that we're going to balance 60% of the concrete dead load. See how that works. So our balance load is equal to 0.6 times 62.5. That's our concrete dead load, which is equal to 37.5 pounds per square foot. For interior spans, the pre-stressing force that's required is W pre-stress L squared over 8A, which is equal to 0.0375, in, now in kips per square foot, times 19 squared, times 12 over 8, times 2.5, or 8.12 kips per foot. Um, that's a little light. I would round that up to, to nine kips a foot. Nine kips a foot is nine over five times 12 or 150 PSI, 0.15 KSI, which is a good range, a good starting point for our, our design. So that kind of establishes our first pass at the pre-stressing force in all the interior spans. We're going to use nine kips a foot from one end to the other. That's this tendon, and it goes from A through F. That's going to be nine kips a foot. Now for exterior spans, the pre-stressing force that's required is the same balance load, O point. 0375, 37 and a half pounds a square foot, times 19 squared, times 12, over 8, times the different sag now, 1.375, and I get a, a required force of 14.8 kips a foot, and we'd round that up to 15 kips per foot. <coughs> So that establishes our first for pre-stressing force and profile. This in the end bay would be 15 kips a foot, so there would be 6 kips a foot of added tendons that are dropped off and anchored here, 9 kips a foot through, and 15 kips per foot in the other end span. So that establishes our force and profile for our first pass. We don't know if this works yet, but using all the information that we have, the balance load and the compression levels, it looks pretty good, and that'll be our first pass at, at our design. Um, we need to adjust our balance loads by the fact that we rounded up the pre-stressing forces. So for interior spans, the balance load would be 9 over 8.12 times 0.03375, which is equal to 0.042, 42 pounds a square foot. For our end spans, we need to round up the balance load by a little bit, 15 over 14.8 times 0 0.0375, which is equal to 38, 0.038 kips per square foot. 
So our balance load in our two end spans with this force and profile is 38 pounds a square foot, and in our interior spans it's 42 pounds a square foot. By the way, in our end span, the compression level F over A is 15 over 60, which is equal to uh, 250 PSI, which is, would be high for if it went all the way through the slab, it's perfectly acceptable if it's just in the end spans, in the two 19-foot end spans. 250 PSI, 15 kips a foot all the way through this slab, would not be acceptable. That would be asking for shortening problems. Uh, but it's completely acceptable in the end spans. Okay, the first load stage that we need to consider is service loads, unfactored service loads. We just established that the balance load, the tendon balance load is uh, 38 pounds per square foot in the end spans and 42 pounds per square foot in the interior spans. That will allow us, with the loads that we calculated, wherever they are, with, with this loading to determine the net loads and we'll do that. Uh, I, I don't know if you have been exposed to the concept of skipped live loads, of uh, uh, pattern live loading. And if, if you haven't, you're going to now. If you have, uh, bear with me. Uh, the the ACI code, really every building code, requires that live load be arranged to produce the maximum possible moment at any location. Um, live, dead load has to be there all the time, but live load can either be there or not be there. And it's interesting that if live load is not present in one span, that can actually increase the moment at other locations in the span. So we're going to arrange this, our live load, so that it produces the maximum possible moment at every location. And let's look at how we do that. Well, let's start out looking at negative moments. Let's take a look and see how we would arrange the live load if we wanted the maximum negative moment at, at support B. Again, we're, we're working with pin support, so there is no moment at joint A. So let's take a look at, at the arrangement of live load for negative moment at support B. Now, it seems rather obvious that we would load both adjacent spans with dead load and live load. That would produce uh, more moment than if just one span was loaded with live load. So we'll start with dead and live acting on A, B, and B, C. What's next? Obviously, the dead load applies all the way across the structure. But now, what do we do with live load in the rest of the structure? Well, if we additional load in this span rotates this joint in this direction, and it actually creates positive moment here. So we don't want to do that. So we don't want live load in this span. Over here, if we load this span, DE, that rotates this joint in this direction and, excuse me, and it does produce negative moment at joint B. So it seems reasonable and obvious that we would load the two adjacent spans with live load and then alternate the loading in the rest of the structure. So that would be our, our loading pattern to produce maximum live load at joint B. And by the way, see that it also applies to joint E because we're symmetrical. So this loading pattern would produce the maximum negative moment at joint B and the maximum negative moment at joint E. Okay, let's do another one. Now let's take a look at the, 
at the maximum negative moment at joint C. And that would apply to joint D also. We would load the two adjacent spans and alternate the loading in the rest of the structure. And that would produce the maximum negative moment at joint C and D. So this is, this is at B and E. This is at C and D. And that takes care of all of our negative moments. How about positive moment? Well, if we wanted positive moment in the end spans, we would load it with live load. Then we would not load. Loading in this span decreases the, live, the positive moment live load, so we would not load live load in alternate spans. We would alternate all the way across. And interestingly enough, this load pattern now produces the maximum positive moment in three spans. It takes care of a lot. It takes care of AB, CD, and EF. It covers all three of those. AB, CD, and EF. And finally, the only thing we don't have now, maximum live load, maximum positive moment in BC and DE, and you can see what's coming. We would load BC and alternate and that would create the maximum positive moment in BC and in DE. So it takes four moment distributions <laughs> to get all of the, the extreme, the maximum positive and negative moments for this five span structure. We have to do four moment distributions. One thing we haven't done yet is to calculate the value of these loading conditions. Um, based on the total load of 105.5 pounds per square foot and the dead load of 65.5 pounds per square foot and the balance loads of 42 pounds a square foot in, in, in interior spans and 38 pounds per square foot in exterior spans, I come up with these loads in pounds per square foot. 68, 64, 24, 64, and 28. That's based on the difference between either total load and the balance load in an interior or an end span, or dead load minus the balance load in an interior or exterior span. Uh, for C and D, I come up with 28, 64, 64, 24, and 68. For positive moment, come up with 68, 24, 64, 24, and 68 pounds per square foot. And finally, 28, 64, 24, 64, and 28. Those, those are all in pounds per square foot. Okay, knowing, yeah. Pardon? I'm not quite sure what those numbers are. Sure, sure. A absolutely. Let's do it. Let's look at the total load minus the balance load. And let's look at an interior span. We have a total load of 105.5 pounds per square foot, right there. And we determined that the balance load was 42 pounds per square foot in the interior spans. 
and make rounding this to 106, that would be 24 pounds per square foot in the, excuse me, 64 pounds per square foot in the interior spans. That's this one. It's the total load minus the balance load for the interior span. Um, for the exterior span, it would be 106 minus 38, which is equal to 68 pounds for the exterior span. That's the 68. For the no live load condition, I'd take the dead load of 65.5 or 66 minus 42 pounds a square foot in the interior spans, which is 24. That would be this number, interior spans. And for exterior spans, it would be 65.5 minus 38, which is equal to 28 pounds a square foot, which would be this one for the exterior spans. It's kind of a pain for just a four pounds per square foot difference, but that's what you have to do. Yeah. Service loads. Unfactored service loads. We're going we're gonna to get the maximum net load moments that exist, both positive and negative, throughout the, throughout the slab and check stresses. So these are service loads, unfactored loads. Good. Yeah, as you can see, it's very tedious. <laughs> you know, but it is a code requirement that virtually all one-way slabs, uh, all one-way construction, uh, is required to have pattern live load or skipped live load. Uh, by the way, uh, most engineers call this skipped live load. Uh, another term is pattern live load. It's the arrangement of live load to produce the maximum uh, moment at any point. And if we were to do that, if we did all of these four moment distributions, here are the moments that we would get. We would get minus 2.49 at B and F foot kips per foot, and we would get minus 2.2 foot kips per foot at C and D. And for maximum positive moment, we would get, and again, these lines don't hook up. These two moments do not, are not in the same uh, moment diagram. For positive moment, we would get plus 2.33 plus 1.24, plus 1.73, plus 1.24, and plus 2.33. Those are the maximum possible moments that can exist in this five-span slab with these balance loads and the specified uh, unfactored loads. Okay, let's take a look at, at stresses that are produced by those moments. Let's take a look at C and D first at these two points. The moment demand, well, I shouldn't use demand because this isn't strength. The uh, net load moment is minus 2.2 .2 foot kips per foot. The section modulus of a solid thickness slab is the moment of inertia divided by half the slab thickness, h over 2. And that is bh cubed over 12 over h over 2, which is bh squared over 6, which for our slab is 12 times 5 squared over 6, which is 50 inches cubed. So the section modulus at the top and the bottom of this 5-inch slab is 50 cubic inches. 
the stresses at C and D are minus F over A plus or minus M net over the section modulus, which is equal to minus 9 over 60, plus or minus, plus at the top, minus at the bottom, because it's a negative moment, 12 times 2.2 over 50, which equals minus 0 0.150 plus or minus 0.528, which is equal to plus 0.378 at the top of the slab, plus 5, uh, 0.528 minus 0 0.150, or plus 378, 0.378, 378 PSI at the top, and minus 0 0.678 PSI at the bottom. Looking at our allow, these are the flexural stresses under service loads. So they're the worst possible flexural stresses that could exist at either C or D. Uh, the, the tensile stress of 378 is, well, let's, our allowables are in tension 7.5 times the square root of F prime C which is 5,000 PSI. I didn't mention that it, the slab strength is 5,000, which is 0 0.530 KSI, and the allowable compressive stress is 0 0.6 times 5,000. The same values that you've been using all quarter. So this tensile stress is less than 530, 0 0.530, and this compressive stress is less than 3 KSI. So, uh, stresses work at C and D. If you were to go through all of the stresses now, at every point, you'd have to do, we've done these two, we'd have to do another one for B and E, just one, because it's the same moment, then we'd have to do... Uh, we'd have to look at these three positive moments, but look at, look at the positive moments. The, uh, I, I, won't, I won't say that. You, you have to look at the, the stress calculation at every one of these points. There are some shortcuts. So, um, but if you did that, if you looked at, at a, a flexural stress calculation at every one of these points, and remember in the two end spans you have not nine kips, per foot, you have 15 kips per foot. So there's a difference in the positive moment and in the negative moment at B and E because of the pre-stressing force of 15 kips a foot. If you did that, you would find that all the stresses work for this slab. I'm not going to do it because it's time consuming and, and it's the same calculation that we just did here. You take for, for these two moments for B and E, um, this moment would be 2.49, uh, and the force would be 15 instead of 9. If you went through all of those calculations, you would find that all of the flexural stresses work for this slab. Okay, what's next? Strength. How thin? Um, I think for normal weight concrete, the minimum slab thickness is four and a half, four and a half inches, Dirk? I'm not aware there is any minimum. I think there, I thought there was. I only know the slab on ground. Maybe wrong. You know, the five inch slab is so burned in. Um, you, it's been years since I've seen anything other than a five inch slab for a parking structure in the span range of, say, 18 to 21 feet. I think that I've seen four and a half inch normal weight slabs before. I think there is a code limitation based on fire of four and a half inches minimum. And I know that it might even be four inches for lightweight concrete, which is more fire resistant than normal weight concrete. But I'll, I'll verify that for you. It's just, you know, we, we never see anything other than five inch slabs.
absolutely right. You, you're going to see that, that w with, this with this force and profile, uh, 9 kips a foot and 15 kips a foot, balancing about 60% of the concrete dead load, uh, that everything is going to work. Look, these stresses aren't even close. These are easy. So this slab works easily. And if, if you were, it, it, some engineers would recognize that and say, well, I, you know, this thing works so easily. Uh, I, let's go to seven kips a foot, you know, in a four and a half inch slab if it works. Don't do it. Don't do it. Stick to these criteria. You're going to see that we'll go through the entire design and um, everything will work with, with this criteria. And everything works rather easily. Um, but would I recommend changing the design? No, absolutely not. No. Uh, not because of the criteria that we've established, the balance load and the compression level. We know that the code says that the demand moment is equal to 1.2 m dead load times the unfactored dead load plus 1.6 times the unfactored live load plus 1.0 times the secondary moment at every point. So let's get the secondary moments quickly in this slab. Um, we know that the secondary moment is equal to the equivalent load moment minus Fe. So let's put the equivalent loads on the slab. We know that in the interior spans, the equivalent load is 42 pounds per square foot. And in the end spans, the equivalent load acting up is 38 pounds per square foot. And if we did a moment distribution with those equivalent loads, these are equivalent load. Our moment diagram for those equivalent loads would look like this. Where the moments at the support would be plus 1.73, plus 1.28, plus 1.28, and plus 1.73. We know that F times E is, well, it's, E is the same at every support. It's um, just one and a quarter inches. This is E. So Fe at the interior supports would be, at the exterior supports, would be 15 kips a foot times 1.25 over 12, which is 1.56. That's a positive. 1.56 here and here. And at the two interior supports, Fe would be 9 times one and a quarter over 12, which is plus 0.94 foot kips. And our secondary moment is the difference between those two values at each point, plus 0.17 here, plus 0.34 here, plus 0.34 here, and plus 0.17 here. So our secondary moment diagram would look like this. We 
go down to 0 0.17 plus it would go down again to 0 0.34 straight line constant at 0 0.34 and up to 0.17 here and back to zero. So those are our secondary moments. They're all positive. Now we have to go through another very intricate, we won't do it, but now that we've got our secondary moments, we need to calculate the moments due to our factored loads. And let's use this diagram for our values. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Because it's 9 kips a foot, F is, is different. F is 15 kips a foot here. See? F is 15 kips a foot here, and it's 9 kips a foot there. The E is the same. The E is an inch and a quarter. So it's 15 times an inch and a quarter divided by 12 at B and, and E, and it's 9 times 1 and a quarter divided by 12 at the interior support. Okay? It's just the force is different. The way it's done, the way it would be done, is there would be tendons that represented nine kips per foot. The spacing would be determined. It'd be a uniform spacing that would result in nine kips a foot, and it would extend from one end of the slab to the other end of the slab. It would be stressed at both ends, at A and F. Then, in the end spans, there would be six kips a foot of tendons just in the end span that dead end, that terminate right here, just past the first interior support. That's how you get 15 kips a foot in the end span and nine kips a foot in the interior spans, physically, with added tendons in the end span. Okay? It's a very common practice. It's, it's extremely common in, in continuous post tension structures that have a different end span force than an interior force. They're called added tendons, and again, they're, they're dead ended somewhere around, uh, well, somewhere past the, the first interior support. They, they run on the same support system, they have exactly the same profile as the through tendons do up to the point where they're dead ended. Yeah. The, obviously there are secondary reactions that produce these secondary moments. Uh, in the design of the, of the slab, uh, those secondary reactions are relatively small compared to uh, the reactions due to applied load and they really play no part. They, they play a huge part in, in moment strength. And obviously there are reactions associated with this, but one reason that we don't directly address them is that the code, for shear, the code doesn't require secondary effects in shear design. And we also know that shear design is, that the shear stresses are very, very low in the one-way slab. So we, they're there, but we don't have to numerically know what they are unless you were actually asked for, what, for, for them. You could calculate what, what these reactions were, but in the actual practical design of the slab, they don't, they don't enter into the de design. The, the beams that are supporting that. Pardon? The beams that are supporting the slab. Yeah. That's what I was asking. Do we account for those in the design? No. 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 In practice, you don't. Okay, uh, let's look at the, 
the um, factored loads, the factored total load with live load acting is zero point one four three KSF, and the factored dead load with no live load is 0 0.079, this number up there. So for our, I remember these numbers. So we still need to do four moment distributions to get all of the factored moments uh, due to factored loads. But here's what they would be. They would be 0.143 here with live load acting, and they'd be 0 0.079 here with no live load acting, 0 0.143, and 0 0.079. Um, the same thing, you'd go through all of these spans. These would be 0 0.143. This would be 0 0.143. Everywhere live load is acting, the the factored load would be 0.143 kips per square foot. Everywhere live load is not acting, uh, the factored load would be 0.079 kips per foot. If we were to run all four of those moment distributions with those loads, with those factored loads, we would get, for negative moments, we would get minus 5.75, but then we have a secondary moment at that point, which I just erased, which is... Uh, plus 0.17 for a total moment demand of 5.58 minus at C and D, and that's, that's at E also. At C and D, we would get a negative moment of 4.81, but we have a positive secondary moment of 0.34. So our demand moment is minus 4.47. So it's minus 4.47 here and minus 5.58 foot kips there. Similarly for positive moment, if I ran the moment distributions, I would get a maximum positive moment of 4.5, 4.51 foot kips per foot. I have a a secondary moment there, which is, we'll assume it occurs at mid-span, it's half of 0.17, let's say, plus 0 0.09. So a demand moment of plus 4.60 at the two end spans. In the first interior support, I'd get a positive moment of, of plus 2.76. Um, I have a, an average positive secondary moment of plus 0.25, so the positive moment would increase up to 3.01. And again, in the center span, I have a, a moment due to the loads, the factored loads of 3.28, and a positive secondary moment of 0.34 for a demand moment of 3.62. And again, these are my demand moments. These are the sum of the moments, the maximum moments that occur at all of the supports and all the mid spans due to this, these four moment distributions with factored loads. And I have added in the secondary moment diagram. It reduces the negative moments it increases the positive moments. Okay. At this point, you might want to take a look at the minimum ACI 
bonded reinforcement requirements. They're the same at the top and the bottom. The area, ACT, is this area where this is two and a half. So ACT is 12 times two and a half, which is equal to 30, and 0 0.004 ACT is equal to 0 0.12 inches squared per foot. So in each, each 12 inch width of slab, there would have to be 0 0.12 square inches of steel, and that applies at the top and the bottom of the slab. And we know that we're not going to, we, we can't supply any less than that in the slab. Well, 0.12 inches squared per foot is number four at 20 inches on center. And if I went through now and calculated the strength of each one of these sections under negative moment and each one of these positive moment sections, I would see that with number four at 20, at the top, typical, at every support and continuous on the bottom, there would be laps, obviously, number four at 20. Again, we can't have, we can't supply any less than number 420 in the slab. That's 0 .004 ACT. And again, if we went through the strength calculation for each one of these demand moments, we would see that the section is adequate with number 420. With nine kips a foot in the interior spans uh, and number 420 at top or, or bottom. All of the strength requirements are satisfied and this would be a very adequate final design for this five span slab in a, in a parking structure. Um, the only thing that I didn't do that, would, that most practicing engineers would do, in other words, this was a very real design, skip live load, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole situation. This is, this is the way it would be done in practice. The only difference would be that there would be a support width, that typically the beams would be 16 inches wide, and you could take advantage of that by reducing both the negative and the positive moments. But you can see that we don't need to do that, that, that the slab works fine without any help from support widths. And again, this is a very practical design. It's balancing 60% of the concrete dead load. Uh, it has adequate compression. It has 150 PSI in compression in the interior spans, 250 in the end spans. Uh, I haven't. I'll do one very quickly. Pardon? Oh, it's exactly the same. The, 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 Let, for example, at, let's say at, at B and E, the, the two supports. The demand moment is uh, minus 5.58 foot kips. Right here, see? The flexural calculation is exactly the same as you've been doing. Uh, one nice thing about the slab is that both the tensile force in the steel, in the, the non-prestressed steel, and the tensile for the force in the pre-stressing steel are at the same elevation. So that's an inch and a quarter down from the top. This is 0.12 times 60, which is equal to 7.2 kips per foot. The, the, the tensile force in the, in the pre-stressing steel, you have to go through the calculation of FPS. You know how to do that. It's exactly the same. Um, that will establish TPS, 
that will give you the compression force in the concrete, the sum of the, of the two, TPS plus T sub S, that will give you A, and that will give you all the dimensions that you need to calculate phi M sub N. Then you have to check on um, that the that the tensile steel, um, the strain in the tensile steel is greater than 0.005, which it virtually always is for slabs. So it's exactly the same as, as you've been doing. It's a little easier, really, because these two forces are at the same elevation. Yeah? One foot. You use 12 inches. Right. B is 12 inches. doesn't matter. You're, you're using the correct force. Uh, the nine kips a foot, in other words, whatever the spacing is to give you nine kips a foot, that's what you have in that one foot dimension. That would result in the correct area of pre stress A sub PS, that results in the correct force. But everything we did is based upon a one foot width, including B, including all the moments, including all the pre-stressing forces per foot. Okay? And the 0.12 square inches of, of non pre stressed steel would be in each one foot dimension. You got 0.12 square inches of steel. Again, that's, that, that's based on some other spacing, but it boils down to 0.12 square inches per foot. Everything's based up, brought back to a one foot dimension. Okay, I think you now know everything that you need to know about one way slabs. <laughs> They're a very popular type of construction. Um, again, their, their, their usage today is almost always in parking structures. I don't see them used in many other types of structures. You occasionally see them used in, in office buildings that have beam and slab framing. But uh, one-way slabs are pretty much out in residential buildings now, uh, in hotels and apartments. Okay, anybody have any? Yeah. Specifically, this, the number four at 20, okay. The, um, <clears throat> do you follow it this far? The 0 .004 times A sub T. You require 0 .12 square inches per foot, okay. What's the cross-sectional area of a number four bar? 0 .2. So the spacing would be 0.2 square inches, that's the cross-sectional area of one bar, divided by 0.12 square inches per foot, and that would be 20. There's a 12 in there somewhere. Got that? It's the area of one bar divided by the requirement of square inches per, per foot. Again, this is per foot, so there's a 12 in here, to, which will get you to 20. I think... This is like 1.68 or something like that. Okay, Dirk, it's yours.